I want to begin this morning by introducing you to a guy by the name of Thomas Thwaites. I've got a picture of Thomas. This is Thomas who for three days a few years ago decided he wanted to see what it would be like to live with goats. So just observing them wasn't enough. It was like method research, okay? He wanted to become a goat as much as possible. So here's what he did. He created this little, uh, these prosthetic limbs so that he could walk on all fours like a goat. He spent three days grazing with the goats, and he actually tried to figure out how he could eat like goats. You can see he's got a little bit of grass in his mouth there. But uh, humans do not have an organ that goats and other plant eaters have. It's uh, uh, called a rumen that has within it microorganisms that break down grass into sugars. And of course, if we try to eat grass, that's not going to happen. And he, he tried a few different methods. He was going to basically swallow some, some microbial mixture. And doctors said, no, don't do that because you're basically putting bugs in your stomach. That's not a good thing. Um, he also was going to use some sort of chemical. Uh, to break down the grass and again they said that's probably not a good idea so he basically collected the grass into a pouch and then cooked it in a pressure cooker at night and a, he still ate grass for three days so that he could get the experience of being a goat now you may be asking as I did why would somebody do this well here's what he said in an interview he said my goal was to take a holiday from the pain and worry of being a self-conscious human being, able to regret the past and worry about the future. Now, laugh at him, and it's okay, because I did too, but that's something a lot of people want, isn't it? They just want to take a break from the pain, the worries, the stresses of existing every day of making it through life. A lot of us feel that, sometimes worse than others, and we just want a break from life. We just want to take a break. And, and what we're really searching for is, is what we talked about last week, talked about peace, we want peace, but what we're really searching for in life is contentment. Because contentment is what's really missing from a lot of folks' lives. Even if they don't realize that's what they're searching for, they're looking for happiness. They're looking for joy. And that's why we've been in this series, this week and one more, and we'll finish this series on joy, joy ride, experiencing joy along the ride of life. God's people should be people of joy. And we've used a definition, a working definition, over the past several weeks that we'll revisit again this week and next week. And our definition is this. It's Rick Warren's definition of joy. Joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. It is the quiet confidence that ultimately, because God's in control, ultimately everything's going to be okay. And so as a result, believing those two things, I'm going to make a determined choice to praise God in every situation. I'm going to praise him regardless of the circumstances that I face because I know that God is in control of all the details. I don't have to be. I trust him with my life. And ultimately, from an eternal perspective, everything's going to be just fine because I'm safe in his hands. Two goals in this series. One is I want you to experience joy, to experience a joy-filled life. And two, I want us to share that joy with others so that they can catch a glimpse of what is available in Jesus Christ, in a relationship with Him. True joy. Joy comes from true contentment that is found only in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That phrase, true contentment, that contentment is a vital part of experiencing joy in life. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So what is contentment? Let's define that. Contentment is being satisfied with what I have regardless of how small it may be. Learning to be satisfied with whatever God chooses to bless me with in life because that is exactly what it is. Anything that I have is a blessing. So learning to be satisfied with what I have regardless of how small or how large it may be. Having contentment. So the question, are you satisfied in life? Paul says, we're in Philippians, but in, in 1 Timothy, Paul says, if you can learn to be satisfied with whatever you have, then you're wealthy. 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. So if your goal is wealth, according to Paul's definition, according to God's definition, it is found in contentment and being satisfied. 
Someone has said that contentment softens our privations, it sweetens our provisions, and makes a cottage as fair as a castle. We live in a world, though, of discontented people. There are people all around us. Maybe even some of you here today are, are just not content with your life. We should be content, especially those of us who know Jesus. We should be content, but many times we spend our lives complaining about things. I mean, how often do you complain during the day or during the week? We complain that our kids are too noisy when we should be thanking God that they're happy enough to make noise. We complain about our house, things that need fixing, when there are thousands of people who don't have a home to live in. We complain about our cars when many people uh, don't have a car. We complain about our jobs when there are a lot of people who are out of work and we wish they had a job. We complain and we complain and we complain, which just shows our discontentedness. We should be content. Benjamin Franklin said, contentment makes poor men rich. And discontentment makes rich men poor. Yeah, that's biblical. You look in Proverbs 13, 7, Solomon made a very similar statement. He said, one man pretends to be rich but has nothing. Another pretends to be poor but has great wealth. Why? Because he's not content. And, and, And we are discontented overall in society. As believers, as Christians, many of us are discontented with our lives. And and this all points to the truth that there is a secret to satisfaction. Poor men acting like they, uh, rich men acting like they're poor, poor men acting like they're rich. It points to the fact that that poor man has discovered the secret of contentment. And there is a secret to contentment, and Paul shows us that. In Philippians chapter 4, if you're not there, turn there. That's where we're going to be today. In verses 10 through 14, we're going to look at, at Paul's secret, the secret that Paul gives us to finding contentment and satisfaction in life. Beginning in verse 10 of chapter 4, Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that once again you renewed your care for me. You remember, the Philippians and Paul, they have a special relationship. And, And Paul's in prison. He's currently chained to a guard. He's worried about the Philippians, that they're going to lose their joy because he is in prison. He's writing them this letter of joy to say, hey, rejoice in the Lord. And, and we talked about uh, the, the different, the many times he uses that word, 16 different times in the book. But he's telling them to have joy. And, and one of the reasons he's writing back to them, he's sending this letter through a guy named Epaphroditus because Epaphroditus brought him some money from the Philippians, even though they didn't have much, they were ministering to him while he's in prison. It had been 10 years since they had seen each other. That's what he means by you've renewed your care for me. They're helping him, even though they haven't really had any contact with him in quite a while. You are in fact concerned, he says, about me, but lack the opportunity to show it. Before that, they just didn't have the opportunity. Now they did, and they took advantage of it. Verse 11, I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content with whatever circumstances I am. I know both how to have little and how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. I'm able to do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. Still you did well by sharing with me in your hardships. He's thanking them for their provisions. It's brought him joy, but he's saying, listen, I've learned to be content regardless of what I have. I want to zero in on a few phrases here, okay? First, in verse 11, he says, I have learned. That that means literally to gain knowledge. He's gained this knowledge. In verse 12, I know, which means to understand or to, to make a discovery. He's discovered how to be content. I've learned in verse 12, again, it's translated, I'm instructed in the King James. It literally means to be initiated into this club, this secret society of of those who are satisfied. What Paul's doing here, the Greek mystery religions of the day use phrases like this. They believe that, 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 that by attaining special knowledge that was available to only a select few, that you were initiated into this religion. It was a popular religion, a form of Gnosticism. And, and so what he's doing is using this language to say, hey, all of those secrets, that, they're not going to bring you contentment, but I have discovered the true secret to being satisfied. I've been initiated into the society of satisfied individuals. I know the secret of contentment, and thankfully... What he's doing is sharing it with the Philippians and as a result sharing with us the secret 
of satisfaction, the secret of contentment. And that's what we're going to look at this morning, the secrets to having contentment and satisfaction in life. First, if we want to have contentment, the first thing we need to do is to learn to rejoice in our substance. Rejoice in in your substance. Rejoice with what, what, praise the Lord for what you have. Don't worry about what you don't have. Praise God for what you have. That's one of the keys is being satisfied. Keys to contentment is being satisfied with what I have. And, and here's, here is a key, a foundational principle to achieving that. Understanding that everything that I have, none of it belongs to me. Everything that I have, if I have anything at all, it is a blessing from God. Looking at what you have as a blessing from God will make you appreciate more what you have and worry less about what you don't have. That's, that's the key. Being satisfied, being thankful for what God has given me. That's why Paul says this in, in 1 Timothy 6, 7, and 8, we should consider everything a bonus, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these things. We can spend our entire lives wishing we had things that we don't, but that creates discontentedness. We, we, we don't need to worry about what we don't have, and we don't need to worry about having our needs met. Here's one of the great promises of following the Lord Jesus Christ, of being a child of God, and, and, and that's this, that God knows your needs. You don't have to tell me. Yes, he wants you to tell him about your needs, and that's, that's one of the privileges of having a relationship. We can tell him everything, but we don't have to tell him because he already knows. He knows your needs. Not only does he know your needs, he's promised to meet your needs. This is why one of the reasons Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 31, do not worry, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we, what will we wear for clothing? The Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. He already knows. That's God himself saying, hey, we got this. I know what you need, and I will meet your needs. God can meet your needs in the way that only he can, and he does it extraordinarily. God will meet your needs in ways that you could never expect. But he will take care of you. He may do it directly. You think about, I think about Elijah in 1 Kings 17. God sent him. He said, listen, I want Elijah, I want you to go and hide near this brook east of the Jordan River. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to provide for your needs. I'm going to send you food through the ravens. The ravens are going to bring you food. And then in verse 6 of chapter 17, we see the ravens kept bringing him bread and meat in the morning and in the evening. And he drank from the wadi. So his his Food and drink was provided for. So sometimes he'll do it directly. I mean, just like the Israelites, manna from heaven. Sometimes God will meet your needs that way. But many times, I, I argue, most of the time, God chooses to use me to meet the needs of somebody else. He chooses to use you to meet the needs of somebody else. He does it indirectly. And here's why. Because the person who's getting his needs met receives a blessing, but also the person who's being used to meet that need receives a blessing. Again, in 1 Kings 17, we see that God sends Elijah to the house of a widow who has nothing, just a small amount of oil, a small amount of flour, and he says, listen, I'm going to use this widow to, to feed you. So he gets there, and she says, I don't have very much, but, but Elijah says, do it, and God will bless you. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. God uses this widow. She makes bread for Elijah. And then when she goes back, those jars that were previously empty have more in them, just enough for another serving. And each time she fixes bread, there's just enough. God provides each day. And while she's meeting Elijah's needs, God is meeting her needs and her son's needs. That's how it works. Both receive a blessings. Many times that's how God operates. And that is exactly how God took care of Paul through the Philippians. Chapter 4, verse 10. Go to verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that once again you renewed your care for me. You were, in fact, concerned about me, but lacked the opportunity to show it. They didn't have the opportunity. Now they did. And remember, they, they had sent money to Paul, as I said a few minutes ago. It had been 10 years since they had been together. They hadn't had the opportunity to, to minister to Paul. At this point, they did. And as soon as they had the opportunity, they, they renewed their care for him. They met his need because they had 
God gave them the opportunity. And here's a good lesson. When, when God lays something on your heart to do for somebody else, do it. Don't wait. When God gives you the opportunity to meet somebody else's need, even if you don't know them, take advantage of that opportunity. God's giving you the opportunity to do exactly what the Philippians did for Paul, exactly what that widow did for Elijah. He's giving you the opportunity to bless that person, and he will bless you as a result of being, uh, of being available, making yourself available, serving the Lord. In Galatians 6.10, Paul says, Therefore, as we have opportunity, we must work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. You know, I could share countless stories throughout uh, our ministry throughout our marriage where people have helped us when we didn't expect it. One time in particular stands out when Mandy and I moved to New Orleans. This was before we had kids. We went, we moved to New Orleans so I could finish seminary. And, and uh, of course, I, I worked as a, a substitute teacher. I worked in a fa fabrics warehouse. I went from a full-time ministry position to part-time uh, employment. Mandy was working in the schools as a speech therapist. Her salary was cut. Our insurance was more. Our cost of living was more and we didn't know how we were going to make it. I remember one time we sat down to write a budget and it ended with her in tears and me just basically saying, you know what, we're just going to have to go on faith here. This is what God's called us to do, so we're just going to have to do it and we did. And I, one month in particular, I mean we made it by the skin of our teeth most months, but one month in particular I was paying the bills and, I, and we sure enough ran out of money. Problem was there was a few more bills that needed to be paid. So I just set it aside, and I said, you know what, Lord, you brought us here. Um, you, you have promised to take care of us, so I'm going to trust you, and, and, and I'll, I'll pay this when, when I've got the money. Well, I kid you not, it was either that day or the next day. I can't remember exactly. I went to the mailbox, and I opened up the mailbox, and my dad, out of the blue, had sent us a check for just enough to cover those bills that hadn't been paid. Uh, you know, I've shared with you before, Mandy and I have always, since we got married, have always been faithful to tithe. We've been faithful to give uh, God 10% and, and more when we have an abundance. And, and, and I believe that that is God answering that promise. Test me. See if I will not open the floodgates of blessing that he tells us. And that's what he did. He provided for our needs in ways that we can never imagine. And in those moments of need where he did it in extraordinary ways through other people, it just highlights the fact that God's in control. And he knew, he knew where we were, and he knew what we needed to be able to get through that particular time. And there have been countless other times that he's done that for us in our family, in our, in our marriage. But here's the point. Here's the thing that you can't forget. Regardless of what God provides, however big, however small, regardless of how he provides it, we have to learn to rejoice in it. And whatever he gives, however much, rejoice in the Lord. Verse 12, he says, I know, Paul said, I know how to both have little and I know how to have a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content, whether I'm well fed, or whether my belly's full, or whether it's empty, whether I'm hungry, whether in abundance, or whether I'm in need. The author of Hebrews also says in Hebrews 13, 5, your life should be free from the love of money. Money itself is not evil, but the love of money uh, results in evil. Be satisfied with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. The truth is, in life, it's, it, sometimes it's harder to be content when you have a lot than it is when you have a little. <laughs> when you have a little, you've got less to worry about. Uh, but when you have a lot, it's easy to become dependent upon stuff. And what you find is that the more you get, the more you want. Uh, you'll never have enough. Enough is never enough. There's always a little bit more, and it's so hard to find contentment and satisfaction. It doesn't matter how many things you have, gadgets, toys. And listen, I love my gadgets and my toys. I love things like that. But finding satisfaction in those things, you'll never find satisfaction. Keeping up with the Joneses never works because usually what happens is keeping up with them is not enough. You end up wanting to be them. You envy them so much, whoever they are. Stuff will not bring you contentment. You will never find contentment in things. So a good lesson. Instead of worrying about what you lack, praise God for what you have. Be thankful for whatever God has chosen to bless you with. Again, Paul says, I know how to both have a little. He's had a little and he's had a lot. He, I know how to be content whether I'm hungry or whether I'm well fed, whether in abundance or in need, whether suffering or not. And he's had both, all of the above. 
but he learned the secret of contentment. Paul was able to be content with what he had. So rejoice in your substance. Second, rest in your situation. Don't worry about what you don't have, and don't try to draw contentment from your circumstances. Circumstances change. Look at verse 11. He says, I don't say this out of need, for I've learned to be content whatever circumstances I'm in. Regardless of my circumstances, he says, I've learned contentment. And 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 remember, Paul, he's not writing this from a beach on spring break. He's writing this from a prison cell chained to a guard. Pretty rough circumstances, but yet he's content. He's learned how to be content regardless of his circumstances. And, and, and so what, what does contentment really mean? We've given a definition, but let's, let's break it down a little bit more. We need to start, I think, by learning about what contentment is not. For one thing, contentment is not complacency. It's not being complacent. I mean, being satisfied but not complacent. You know, complacency is basically saying, you know what? I, I've done all I need to do. I don't need to do anything else in life. And just being lazy, being sitting still when you could be moving forward. You know, having ambition is not contradictory to spirituality, okay? I mean, we should be the best at whatever we do simply because, if for no other reason, God gifted us in the area of what we're doing. I mean, why, why be an office boy or an office girl when you could be the president of the company with some hard work? You know, why make C's when you can make straight A's if you're a student? Uh, Why be content to play third string when you could be an All-American if God's gifted you to do that? Why be content with being just a mere follower of Christ when you could be the next Billy Graham and shake up the world for God? If God's gifted you, be the best at whatever it is. God gave us His best in Christ so he deserves our best in everything that we do. And here's many other reasons, but one of the most important reasons we should excel at whatever God's gifted us in. Yes, it requires hard work. It requires dedication. But one of the reasons is because in that area, whatever it is, the greater success I have, the greater influence for Christ I can have. All right, I can influence more people for Jesus. That's, that's what the prayer of Jabez is all about. It's not health and wealth. It's God increase my territory so I can influence people for you. We should have a desire to be the very best. And listen, don't, don't give God second best in your everyday things. And don't ever think that you've arrived spiritually. It's another danger. Don't be complacent with your spiritual growth. Don't ever think, hey, there's nothing more I can learn. You know, I know it all. I know the Bible. Uh, I've been in Sunday school since I was a kid. Don't ever think that there is not, there's not more you can do to grow spiritually. As long as you are alive, as long as I'm alive, and as long as there's breath in my body, there's more I can become like Jesus. Because I won't be like him until I see him face to face. Spiritual growth is a lifelong process. Yes, you are, I mean, you are justified the minute you're saved, but that process of sanctification, that process of becoming like Christ lasts the rest of your life. Don't ever become complacent with where you are spiritually. This, this is what Paul would classify as a holy discontentedness, okay? Not discontented with my situation, my circumstances, my life, what I have or don't have, but discontented with where I am spiritually. It's what, what, what makes us strive to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We talked about a few minutes, a few weeks ago. It's what causes me to reach for that prize that Paul talks about that's waiting for everybody who's faithful, waiting in heaven for everybody who's faithful. It, it's that desire... To, to, to grow. It's not about material things. It's, it's about giving God my best in everything. Because again, He deserves my best. He gave us His best in Christ. He deserves my best in everything that I do. Complacency basically means that I no longer care about what happens in my life. That I don't care good or bad. You know, contentedness is being satisfied with where I am. Complacency means I just don't care. And that's not where God wants us to be. He wants us to care. He cares, so we should care about our lives, about the impact we have or don't have. Complacency is basically just giving up. But we are all here. Listen, if you're struggling with this this morning, let me assure you, you are still on earth for a reason. If you are here, God has a purpose for you being here. You are not a mistake. Regardless of how your life began, you know, there are accidental parents, but there are no accidental babies. I believe that. 
God designed you. The Bible says he created you in your mother's womb. He knew you before he ever created you. You have a purpose in life. And if you are still alive, and listen, I know there's pain, there's suffering, there's heartache, there are things that make us doubt who God is and why he's doing the things that he's doing. But if you are here today, you're important to God and he has got a purpose for you being here. Don't ever get to the point where you just give up on life. I know it's easy to do, but trust in the Lord. Depend on him. Know that you are valuable to him and that he loves you. God loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. Now, I've got two sons, and I can tell you right now, there's not a soul in this room that I would give one of them for. Not, not, not any. I love you, but not that much, okay? But God gave his son. Not only did he give his son, he gave it to people who didn't, that didn't appreciate it, didn't ask for it, didn't want it, didn't recognize we needed it until he showed us our need. God loves us, and he loves you. You are important. Don't ever give up. But there's a fine line because we can never forget our need for God. We can never get to the point where we get so self-sufficient that we don't recognize our dependence upon him. We must depend on God. Contentment is being satisfied in the Lord. It's not being complacent. It's also not a natural attribute of man. It's not something that comes naturally. Contentment doesn't come naturally to us. Look again at verse 11. The second part, I've learned to be content, Paul says. I have learned. It's a learned trait. We learn it by practice, and we know it by experience. It's something that we have to learn. Contentment is not having everything that I think I might enjoy either. It's not found in things. It's not having whatever I want. God's Word speaks perfectly to this in Ecclesiastes chapter 2. Solomon says in verse 10, All that my eyes desired, I did not deny them. And Solomon had everything. I did not refuse myself any pleasure, for I took pleasure in all my struggles. This was my reward for all my struggles. That's how he justified it. When I considered all that I had accomplished and what I had labored to achieve, I found everything he experienced the best the world had to offer. And he says, I considered it all to be futile in a pursuit of the wind. There was nothing to be gained under the sun. Solomon is showing that he learned by practice and knew by experience the satisfaction and contentment that those could not be found in things. He learned contentment, but not, he didn't find it in things, and he had everything. Later on in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, he says, The one who loves money is never satisfied with money, and whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with income. This too is futile. John D. Rockefeller was once asked how much money it took to make a man happy. In his response, he said, just a little bit more. And he had as much or more than, than most human beings. You never find, because what you find is you get something and you want some, there's something else you don't have. Money, things will never, and they're fine. Listen, if God's blessed you with a lot, then praise the Lord. But you'll never find happiness. You'll never find contentment. David warned in Psalm 62.10 that we should place no trust in oppression or false hope in robbery. If wealth increases, he says, don't pay any attention to that. That's fine. And David had a lot too, okay? But he's saying that's not where true contentment comes. And no matter how much you have, it's, it's like the little boy who, who begged his dad. He, he, said, if, if, he said, Dad, if, if I only had $5, I'd be happy. So his dad who had $5, took, took out a brand new crisp $5 bill, gave it to his son. And as the son was walking away, the son said, man, I should ask for 10. <laughs> if I don't, I, just $5, dad, and I'll be happy. Man, I should ask for more. Yeah, that's, that's the way we are, isn't it? I get what I'm, what I'm reaching for, that thing, whatever it is, and then there's something else. There's something newer. There's something better. No matter how much you have, it'll never be enough. Contentment is not having everything that we think we need. So what is contentment? We've looked at what it's not. What is it? Contentment is shifting the source of our satisfaction from without, from our circumstances, shifting it from that to within, to the Holy Spirit's presence in my life. Contentment comes from the presence of Christ in your life and in my life. If you don't have Jesus, you won't find contentment. Because that, he is our source of contentment. Paul said he had learned to be content in whatever circumstances. Why? Because he learned to focus on Jesus regardless of what his circumstances were. Regardless of whether he had a lot or whether he had a little. You know, circumstances don't define contentment. A lot of people think, hey, listen, if we could just achieve world peace, we would find contentment. 
I found an interesting t- statistic this week. Um, I discovered that America, since its existence, since 1776, America has been at war for 93% of that time. Less than 20 years since its birth has this country been at peace. And what about the rest of the world? Well, of the past 3,400 plus years, give or, give, add a few to that, humans have been entirely at peace for only 268 years. Over the past 3,400 years, 268 of those have we seen peace. Just 8% of the time. But see, here's the thing. I mean, we could have world peace, but there would still be discontented people. Because circumstances do not define, do not make us content. We can't find contentment in that. So it's best to follow Paul's advice in Colossians 3, 2. Let your mind set your minds on what is above, not as on what is on the earth. You know, focus on eternal things, not on your circumstances. The first step contentment is moving your attention away from circumstances and toward Jesus. Out, away from the external and on his presence in your life. Contentment comes from the Holy Spirit's presence in my life. Something else. Contentment is not a result of having great wealth. We've established that. So what is it? It's in having few wants. Focusing on Christ and wanting little. Learning to live with a little. That, that's what Paul had done. Learning to live with a little. Contented people are satisfied with their lot in life. People who aren't contented want a lot more. Learn to be content with whatever God gives you. Learn to live with a little. Paul said in Philippians 4.19, later on in the same chapter, he said, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches, not out of, but in proportion to, an equal amount of, according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. And his riches are innumerable. I mean, you can't count his riches. So if God's going to supply my needs from that, according to that, that's, that's a pretty good deal, isn't it? God will supply your needs. Contentment is not in having everything we want, but enjoying what we have. Also, contentment is self-surrender. Now, that's kind of a Christianized word, but let me tell you what it really means. It means to be self-contained. It, it was used to describe a city that did not eat, need imports. Everything that the citizens needed to survive was contained in that city. It's like when you go on a cruise. Hopefully, at least, that cruise ship has everything on board that you need to survive, that all the passengers need to survive. It's basically saying that we have everything we need in Christ. It's already there. John 4, 14, Jesus said, Whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water that I give will become a well of water springing up with within him from eternal life. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying, I've given you my Holy Spirit. If you have put your faith and trust in me, I've given you my spirit. That means you have everything you need to survive on board already. I'm going to provide you with what you need physically, and I'm going to provide you with what you need, more importantly, spiritually. Everything we need is contained within us. The Holy Spirit living in and through us, working through us. We have all that we need. Adversity proves Jesus to be true riches. Not my quote. Not original to me. Adversity proves Jesus to be true riches. Abundance proves Jesus to be greater than riches. Whether I have a lot or I have a little, Paul says. Why is that? Because my joy doesn't come from a lot or a little. My joy comes from the presence of Jesus in my life. And he is the center. When he's the center of my life, I have joy and I have contentment because I know I have all that I need in him. Every event in life becomes an opportunity to make Jesus known. That's the way Paul viewed his imprisonment. I mean, he was suffering. He had been beaten. He was not in good circumstances. But he viewed it being chained to that guard was just another captive audience that he could share the gospel with. Just another person he could lead to the Lord. And and those guards would go back to their barracks. That elite praetorian guard, they would go back and lead those other elite guards to the Lord, and their families would come to Christ. Paul knew it was an opportunity, his imprisonment, being chained. Go back to verse 12 and 13 of chapter 1. He said, now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me, again, he's, he's saying, don't lose your joy. I'm just fine. Yeah, I've suffered, but here, what's happened to me has actually resulted in the advance of the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard. And to everyone else that my imprisonment is in the cause of Christ. Paul was able to make the most of any situation he found himself in. He was able to rest in his situation because he had contentment in Christ. We should be able to do the same. The third key, the third secret 
to finding contentment is that we need to realize our strength. Where does our strength come from? It's not from things. It's not from my ability. It's not from others' abilities. God uses other people to meet my needs and your needs. But our strength doesn't come from those things. Look again at verse 13. Paul says, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, first, Paul did not say, I can't. That's the phrase that many people use, right? I can't do this. Lord, I can't possibly do that. That's too big. I'm not able to do that. I can't grow. I can't be the type of Christian that this person I looked up to is. I can't accomplish this for you. And I can't shake up the world for Christ. I'm not gifted enough to do that. I can't do this, that, or that. Or we can't because we've never done it that way before. That's a popular phrase used in churches today, right? I can't. That's not what Paul says. Now, the other thing he didn't say by itself, he didn't just say, I can. He didn't stop there. That's the other. That's the language of, one's the language of pessimism. This, that's the language of presumption. You know, a lot of people say that too. I don't need the Lord. I don't need church. I don't need the Bible. I can do, I can handle my life. I'm the captain of my own ship. I don't need anybody. That's not what God wants, and that's not what Paul said either. Uh, if you have that attitude, you'll end up like the rich young ruler in Luke chapter 12. He, Jesus, told them a parable. A rich man's land was very productive. He thought to himself, what should I do since I don't have anywhere to store my crops? I will do this, he said, depending on his things. He said, I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and store all my grain and my goods there. Then I'll say to myself, you have many good store, goods stored up for many years. Take it easy, eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? You can't depend on things. If you depend on things or your ability, you're going to end up like him. You'll find out that those aren't enough. Your life could be taken in a moment. Then what will you have? Because you won't take those things with you. Look at what Paul says again. He says, I can, I am able, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can through Christ. It's his strength. It's dynamic contentment. It's power that comes from Christ. It's victory over every temptation. It's grace in every trouble. It's strength in every trial. Not from myself. It's not defeatist. I can't. It's not I can. I've got this. It's through Christ. Dynamic Christian living. Totally dependent upon Jesus. Him at the center of my life. Not focused on my circumstances. Focused on his presence in my life. He's at the center. And Paul says, I can do all things. Now, what is that? Is that like Superman, you know, faster than a speeding bullet, stronger than a locomotive, able to leap tall buildings? No, it's not, I can do anything I want. I'm that strong. It is the power. Jesus gives me the power to face all of life's adversities, all of life's challenges. Whatever comes my way, Paul says, hey, I've learned to have how to be content with a lot or with a little, I've also learned to be content whether I was suffering or not. Whatever adversity life brings, whatever Satan tries to throw at me, Jesus gives me the power to handle it all, to face it all. Again, by his strength, not my own. Go back to verses 6 and 7, the same chapter, chapter 4 we quoted last week. Don't worry about anything. Don't be anxious, Paul says, but in everything... Through prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, be thankful. God knows your needs. He's going to provide them. Then present your requests to God. And the peace that transcends all human comprehension will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Be thankful. Trust in the Lord. Later on that same chapter, put it all into context. Paul says, hey, God's in control. I trust him. I've found contentment. So I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm able. He enables me to do all things. People succumb to worry and discontentment all the time because they can't cope with life. They can't handle all things. Nobody can on their own. But Jesus gives us the power to face anything that comes our way with contentment, with joy. Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. And Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that phrase, strengthens me, is so very important. It's not my strength. It's not your strength. Christ infuses his strength into my life and your life. 
When you can't walk, Jesus will carry you. When you don't know how it's all going to work out, he will comfort you. When you don't know where that next meal is going to come from or how that next bill is going to be paid, God's got it under control. He may make you wait for a little while. He may make you be in need, maybe even suffer some. But ultimately, God's in control of all the details of my life. So ultimately, everything's going to be just fine. Even if I walk out of this building today and my life ends just like that, everything's just fine because I know the next face I'll see will be his. God's got it. He's got your life. If you belong to him, if you have trusted in him, if you are saved by his grace through faith in Jesus Christ, he has got you in his hands. And there is nothing the Bible says. God himself said there is nothing that can take you out of his hands. Nothing can harm you that he doesn't allow, and nothing, absolutely nothing, can harm you from an eternal perspective. Your life is secure. Your destiny, your soul is secure in his hands. That's the key. It's his strength. And what's more, it's, it's in the present tense, which means it's strength for today. Tomorrow he'll give me strength for tomorrow. It's strength each day. Each day he gives me strength to survive. Each day. He gives me what I need to survive. If I focus on him, I have contentment. Because here's the truth. It's Jesus that makes the difference. It's not things. It's not happiness. It's not circumstances. It's Christ that makes the difference. It's kind of like this glass of water here. Okay, I've got a couple of eggs here, all right? These are just fresh eggs. They're not spoiled. They're not boiled or anything like that. But this, just this glass of water, if I take this egg and put it in the water, what's going to happen? It's just going to sink to the bottom, exactly like that. Because there's nothing, I mean, there's nothing to keep it. If it was spoiled, it would float, right? That's how you know, don't eat it, all right? But, but this one's fresh, so it's, it's just going to sink. Well, what I have in here, I've got some salt water. I've been letting this sit since about Thursday, I think. You know, we were on our camping trip, so I mixed up some salt water. And I've just been letting it sit. You'll see the difference. I mean, it's pretty saturated once I get it all in there. And if you've ever swam in the ocean, is it easier to float in the ocean or is it easier to float in your swimming pool? Unless you use salt water, I guess, in your swimming pool. It's easier to float in the ocean, right? I can't float in regular, you know, just fresh water. Uh, I've just never been able to. I'll sink like a rock, okay? But in the ocean, I can float a little bit. Well, same thing, fresh egg, just in salt water. And it floats. Now, what's the difference between this and this? Without the salt, sink like a rock. With the salt, you float. And let me tell you, the difference between sinking into discontentedness, the difference between sinking in life and not sinking is Jesus. I mean, Jesus said he'll make us the salt of the earth, the salt of the world. The reason is, is because he has placed that within us. It's his presence in our lives. I mean, it's it's his strength, it's his power. The difference between making it in life, finding contentment, finding joy, and sinking into whatever your circumstances are, discontentedness, a lack of joy, sorrow, misery, giving up on life, the difference is Christ. He is who makes the difference. So listen to me. If you're here today and you're struggling with being content, first let me ask you, do you know Jesus? Do you have his presence in your life? He came and he died on the cross for your sins so that you wouldn't have to pay the price. He gave his life for you, but you have to receive the gift that he offers. You have to trust in him and only him for salvation. If you don't have contentment, it may be because you don't have Jesus. Without him, you will not find contentment. But if you do have him, there's some of you here today, you can be saved, you can have all the things in the world you want and still be discontented because you haven't placed him in the center of everything. You haven't learned to find joy from his presence. You're looking in other areas. Wherever you are today, let me ask, where do you take joy from? Where do you look for contentment? Because 
It's Jesus. Here's the truth that we all need to come to understand as we live our lives, whether you're a father, a mother, a child, a student, whether you're uh, single, whether you're a grandparent, whether you're a widow or a widower, whatever, wherever you are in life, here's what we all need to learn. If we want contentment, if we want joy, we need to discover what Paul discovered, and that is this truth. Jesus is all I need, period. For what? For everything. Jesus is all I need. If you'll learn that, if you'll focus on him, you'll find true joy and true contentment. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for blessing us with things that we don't deserve, and you do. You bless us with, with provisions. You bless us with the things that we need to live. You bless us with more than we deserve, more than we need, because you love us and you want to bless us. You bless us with all that we need physically. You bless us with everything that we need spiritually to become more like you. There are so many people, Father, we know, and we all struggle from time to time with being discontent. But you give us the secret to contentment, and that is, is drawing our contentment not from things, not from circumstances, not from having a lot, not from feeling good or being happy. We draw our contentment from your presence, your strength, your power, your provisions in our life. Lord, if we can just focus on you and, and you alone. And, and Lord, that may mean for some people here today, they need to put their faith and trust in you for the first time. They don't know you as Lord and Savior. And they don't know contentment because they don't have you in their life. And they, I pray that if that describes somebody here today, that they would come during this invitation and make the most important decision they'll ever make, the decision to trust you with their life, to accept the gift of salvation that can only come through your son, Jesus. Jesus, that you, you offer us eternal life and you offer to take care of us. And for some of us, that means that we, we know you, but we need to, to focus on you and draw our joy and strength from you and you alone and not from all of the other things in our life. We need to trust you from day to day, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, whether we have a lot or a little or whether things are good or bad or whatever's going on. Lord, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts in this moment. If there are other decisions that need to be made, Father, whether it's church membership or baptism or whatever it is, Lord, I pray that we would just let you speak to our hearts and that we would respond as you would have us respond. For it's in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. Would you stand for our time of commitment?